I thought I would try to do is um, give you a, just a quick introduction to, to what, what Hill looks like, what life looks like for us, uh, just a very, very brief history of the company so you kind of see uh, what life looks like for a mechanical out of Chicago uh, in the U.S. And then, um, and then I thought we could kind of go through really two sections here, one on the technology and the processes that we employ today that we're looking to employ in the near future. Um, so things like fabrication and modular construction and things like that. <clears throat> and, then, um, and then the second half talk about kind of like what those things mean for the way we collaborate and the way we, um, and the way we um, you know, integrate with other companies, uh, with other construction companies, with owners, um, and so forth. So, uh, with that, uh, I, I think, you know, what we really want to talk about is um, just a real, real brief history. So we started in 1936 under the name L.C. Coleman. So we've been around for a little while, a pretty humble, humble beginning, humble roots. Um, some, some key projects and important milestones. So this is going to go back. Uh, I got a question earlier this morning about how long have we been working on some of this stuff. And when I say some of this stuff, I think we mean, you know, really, really in, injecting technology and process change into the mechanical contracting business. That's the way I would kind of word that. And um, it's, it's been since about 2003. So, um, you know, jobs like Soldier Field, where we started looking at, uh, you know, different means and methods for connecting things. Um, you know, this was, a, this was a tower in 2005 where, you know, and again, lead and some of these other words, they didn't really exist when I started in this business in 1998. Um, but this job was 100% design build, so we were the engineer of record for all the mechanical uh, and plumbing systems. Um, and we were also the lead commissioning agent. Um, so just, you know, you're starting to see around 2005 your responsibilities as a mechanical start to grow, start to change, start to become maybe a little bit more um, uh, inclusive of, of, other, of other concerns like, you know, energy efficiency and things like that. Um, the only other thing I would point out here is at BIM at this point for us meant that, you know, that things that we put in a drawing looked like things that our foreman actually welded up and, and, and connected up and hung up in the air. And to be perfectly honest with you, that, that, that in itself was a change. Um, you know, our, our business when I started in the late 90s was a foreman-driven operation, right? Um, and those drawings that we gave the foreman sometimes were used, sometimes they were tablecloths. Um, you know, we started to see high-definition uh, uh, point cloud laser scans uh, around 2006. And again, none of this is meant to go into a deep dive on this particular technology, but uh, again, just to kind of tell the just to kind of illustrate our changing story over the last, say, tw you know, 10, 12 years. Um, but so that was a big deal. Now we're, we're going into existing plants and we're getting scans and um, real, ha you know, having real spatial information um, in a totally different way. Um, again, this, this tower right here, this is 90 stories we did in 07. And uh, this one, we were the design assist partner meaning ultimately through a bunch of different reasons, we became the engineer of record for the entire mechanical, even though we actually only self-performed the mechanical piping and um, the ventilation, the sheet metal ventilation on this particular project went to a competitor, but we were still in charge of being the engineer of record um, just because again, you're, you're more and more involved in, on the design side, you're more and more involved in these projects. Um, Data centers is something that's driven a, a, a significant part of our, of, our, of our revenue over the last, say, 10 years. Um, so mission critical and data centers. And what we started to see in these type of projects is, you know, no shit over 50% of the, of the labor being performed in our shop. So you cost code your shop labor, you cost code your, your field labor, right? And obviously, you, you know, most of us are going to have further breakdowns beyond just that. But... When you go look at a job at the end of the day and you say over 50% of my piping trade hours happened inside my fabrication shop, um, that's a big deal. So we started to see this happen around 2007. Um, obviously, we're not going to go into it, but you know, it would be remiss if you didn't you know, just mention the fact that digital coordination changed all of our lives in such a fundamental way. You know, being able to go in there and have managed digital coordination 
um, really is what allows us to do all of this fabrication, modular construction, right? A lot of that, I think, we need to remember is predicated upon knowing that we can build uh, according to our models because we've, we've, we've done the collision checking or whatever you want to call that, that process. Um, I am going to go through a little bit of how we use robotic laser layout, how that ties to our hangar fabrication process because I think it's a, it's an, it's a, uh, I think it's very interesting and it tells a, a, a an important story. Um, uh, we started integrating our estimating systems with BIM and fabrication, um, uh, you know, around 2009, 2008, 2009. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail because I think it's important. The other thing I'd mention here is that I am going to be explicit about this particular software package or this particular software package. I got box shots, there's a bunch of Autodesk stuff, there's non-Autodesk stuff, but I do just feel, I, and I know sometimes, you know, these presenters want to be agnostic about the software, but I just, it's so, look, when you inject these things into your business model and you're an at-risk contractor, I think you lose the ability to just say, well, I'm agnostic about how that actually happens. And we have to talk about the actual software platform. So um, if you don't mind, I was going to be explicit when it, when it comes to those systems. Um, we built a data center for Oracle in Utah, so I know I'm not in America right now, but it's you know smaller than Australia in terms of landmass. But the distance between Chicago and Utah is uh, you know is about 1,800 miles, so it's a totally different part of the country. Um, we weren't signatory to any of the unions, uh, but we were able to build uh, to to find a mechanical partner, and we built most of this data center for Oracle on the mechanical side in Chicago. Knocked it down and uh, sent it across the country, broken down. Um, this is a hospital in Chicago uh, that we did in 2010, uh, where we really started to look at uh, copper uh, fabrication and copper prefabrication. I'll show you some examples of what that looks like. Um, and then we did another, another uh, which is another hospital, but it's another job where we're in somebody else's jurisdiction. This is just a few hundred miles outside of Chicago, um, but the way, you know, the way our unions work, and you know, Chicago's got about 10 million people, so that metro area really is a very strong, um, it's a strong economy, it's a strong metro market. When you go a few hundred miles out into, you know, the, the, the hinterlands, um, you, you're in a different part of the country. We were able to, uh, so this particular job was a $27 million hospital project mechanically, um, of, of which 17 million ended up being um, to our local installing mechanical subcontractor. Um, but again, all of the, you know, it turns out if you have really great BIM and really great fabrication, you know, you can, you can do this thing called smarts and parts where you're effectively driving the process and protecting yourself um, in terms of risk by having, by having the model and doing all the fabrication. And I think, I think a lot of that will be even more clear when we get through uh, some of the beginning of this. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in some detail about what we're calling modular construction because it's probably one of the most dynamic parts of our business right now. Um, and it's, and it's, I think, I think it's going to be really, really important. Uh, so we're going to show some examples of modular construction. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about IPD and about how we, how we actually execute these contracts, how we, um, some of the different environments we're in, contractual environments, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. But just for the record, um, we've only ever done one true IPD project. This is the only one we ever did where there was really a shared risk, um, a, a communal fund um, in terms of contingency monies um, that were shared. Those, those contingency monies were shared. And, um, and, uh, and it went well, but again, this was the only time we were, ever, you know, we were ever able to really get the owner, uh, the GC, um, the architect, uh, all to really kind of um, play nice with each other. I shouldn't say that, not play nice with each other, but really put each other's risk, share each other's risk. Um, that was the only time we really ever did that. Um, and then we'll talk about our, our, again, our modular construction. These are bathroom pods, but we got three jobs of this going on, and I've got some, some quick video and we'll show you guys <clears throat> what that looks like. So that's kind of our story. I'm going to talk just about, for the next three minutes or so, just about myself, my team, uh, the company, and, and where, we're, where we're at today. 
Um, I, have, I have three technology professionals that I employ. Um, both, these two are under 23, or these two are 23, and that one's, I think, 26 uh, at this point. And, and the reason why I actually put, put, put them in here is, um, one, because they built this presentation for me, so that makes them feel good. <laughs> But also, I just, you know what, look, I, I, we, most of us in this room are mechanicals um, or related to that business, and I just think it's, it's important to understand we need to embrace young people, technology, and the ability to use that technology to improve our business. Um, and so that's what, this is our commitment, is a few people to really uh, run around and do some really important things. So. Uh, Couple of just slides. Again, 10,000 completed projects starting in 1936. These are all Chicago jobs. Uh, that's a, that's a, a library at the University of Chicago where uh, underneath this glass dome is a 50-foot hole um, where there's, it's a whole mechanical book retrieval system. Um, that's a tower. That's the Art Institute. That's one of the biggest buildings in the world in terms of actual raw square footage because of Merchandise Mart. Um, so uh, we understand what high profile, high risk, uh, high reward contract execution looks like. I, I feel like I think we do. Um, what we actually do is mechanical piping, refrigeration, uh, plumbing. What do we call plumbing? Hydraulics. hydraulics. Uh, we call it plumbing, call it hydraulics. Um, I call hydraulics something else that's strange. Uh, fire protection, um, that's the same word here, right? Um, Energy efficiency, sustainability, maintenance, commissioning, retro commissioning. We have our own testing and balancing group. We do lead consulting and we have engineering services. Um, so, you know, yeah, nominally we're at about 250 million in US dollars. Um, I would say, you know, 75% of that right now though is gonna be our mechanical uh, ventilation, sheet metal, plumbing, fire protection, construction services, you know, new construction existing retrofit. Um, Couple other slides. Uh, we, we recently moved outside of the city just a few miles into a new space where we've got a true 104,000 square foot uh, production space. So that's, that houses our piping shop, our plumbing shop, and our sheet metal shop. I've got some pictures of that. Um, but it allows us to really ramp up in terms of our ability to produce in-house. Um, we're on a 26 acre campus. I've got some pictures of that too. Um, and then obviously we're only really as good as our people. So, and again, just to give you a sense of what an American mechanical looks like, we've got about 200, 210 office right now, um, and then as many as 900 when you include all of our, uh, all of our craft people and our trades people. So, a um, couple of things, uh, again, just to kind of kick us off onto where we are and why we are, um, is that th this is a, I think these are real things. This came from one of these you know, BS BIM things, but I put it up there because it, I, these are real, right? Our industry is not exactly real, real productive when, you, when measured against uh, particular manufacturing, right? Um, technology has evolved, right? You couldn't go out in 1990 and go buy a 3D modeling system for whatever it costs, $5,000 or $4,000, whatever the hell Autodesk or, or Bentley or whatever they're selling them for right now. Like those are manageable monies now that weren't manageable, you know, 20 years ago. And, um, you know, we heard from Bill yesterday. We heard from a, a couple of other people on the owner side of things. And, um, you know, owners are getting smarter and owners are uh, demanding value in, 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 in different ways, right? So traditionally they demanded value by saying, you're going to give me the right price because I'm going to bid... I'm going to bid you against your competitors until I'm happy. And um, that didn't always lead to the most productive, the best, most efficient results. Um, and so there are sophisticated owners that are looking out there and saying, look, we're going to inject ourselves into this process and we're going to make this thing uh, go well. So some trends. Obviously, BIM digital coordination, that's a big deal, right? We talked about that a little earlier. Prefabrication, that's kind of a big deal. That's, that's uh, changing the way we deliver. Um, modular construction, I think, is going to be increasingly important. Um, we talk about this in the United States. I'm not sure if you have, I, I know you have it here. I don't know if the terminology is the same, but this idea of lean construction, 
If you look at like what automakers went through in the 80s in terms of you know, employing robotics and other types of tools to kind of like streamline their manufacturing process, we're doing the same thing on the construction side. <clears throat> and then sustainability life cycle and facility management. So again, coming back to this idea of having more satisfied owners with um, uh, more efficient projects. So that's kind of, that's kind of kicks off this whole little, um, this, this, this speech. Uh, the next, really the next, the whole rest of the thing is either embedded into this idea of let's talk about technology and process or collaboration. And the way I kind of think I would talk about this is, you know, let's, here we're gonna go through a set of things that I think are things we've done internally to help us be better mechanicals. And then I think here we're gonna talk about things that we can maybe employ out of that um, to be better collaborative partners when it comes to uh, mechanical contracting and, and, and construction. So, um, so for the technology process, the things I wanna go through are content estimating, uh, BIM, robotic layout, fab, modular, and some, some what we call BI, or business intelligence things. Um, so I think the story starts for us with content, right? And I'm not gonna go into a ton of this because I actually believe that there's a bunch of different elements within the Australian market that are even more sophisticated, um, that are extremely sophisticated, maybe even more sophisticated than some of the stuff we're doing. So you guys really seem to have a handle, especially after yesterday, and, some of the BIM Met Boss initiatives. You know, we don't have any initiatives, you know. Um, I would love to get there. Um, one of you guys go tell New York there's a new initiative, you know. Um, they're gonna tell you something else. Um, the, but, and it's just, it's just, it's a pretty diverse, it's not, you know, you, you don't just call LA and New York and, and Boston and say, hey, let's have a meeting. Um, so it's, uh, so you really left your own devices when it comes to some of this stuff. So a lot of the value we found out of these technologies really does rest on having quality content. So, um, our, and our content is, is, is uh, not generic. Everything is based on a specific manufacturer. If there's multiple competing versions of a copper fitting or a hanger or a valve, we will have multiple versions in our, um, in our database of, of content. So high quality content based on the real world for us is extremely important. Um, and so again, that's inclusive of all of your, you know, your, uh, your pipe work and your ancillaries and your valves and your fire dampers and your round duct and your unistrut and your angle iron and your uh, hydraulic fittings, can I say that? Or um, we would call it DWV or drain waste vent. Uh, you know, your gravity-driven systems. Um, so it's important to have that. It's important to take the time to have that one way or the other, whether that's something you buy or you develop through, a, through an initiative. Or, um, it's really important to get there. We happen to have had, um, over the years, we've developed that ourselves internally. And maybe that's somewhat um, on account of our, uh, of our size, uh, being able to to spend the time to do that, but that was, I just wanna make the point that none of this works without quality content that you can trust. Um, so estimating. Um, so we're gonna talk about different contractual relationships here in a little bit, but for the time, you know, for the time being, I wanna just talk a little bit about these estimating systems and kind of show you what they look like. A lot of the time, whether it's a IPD hybrid light mumbo jumbo thing, or a true just bid build, here's the drawings, give me a number, you know, and, and we're gonna knock you around against a whole bunch of other mechanicals. At some point, somebody's gotta produce something that looks like a document that I can tr try to start to understand, wrap my head around so I can price, right? Um, so this is, so these are 2D PDFs. We load this into, uh, into Autodesk's um, uh, SMEP or SMEP, the name changes so much, but we do what's called on screen, I, I am talking to them about that too, but uh, we do a thing called on screen takeoff where you suck the PDF in and then you draw on top of it. And so you do this thing we talked about, um, uh, we talk about it as you know, clicking around or click, 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 right? So you pick a size. In this particular case, you're picking, say, a six inch line and you're putting it right there and, and you're picking a two inch line and you're putting it right there at that elevation. Again, these are very, very quick motions. We've got 35, 32 to 35 project engineers, project managers. We all estimate our own work. 
Um, and so every one of them uses on, on screen uh, takeoff to, to get things done. And, and, and that does a couple of things. One, uh, you know, some of the intelligence it, it fills in for yourself. So in that particular case, you're getting, um, you're getting a, a, a thread a lot, a nipple, um, a, a dielectric, not a dielectric, it's just a, um, a bronze ball valve that we're kind of using as a dielectric, and the adapter, and then your sweat, right? So all that's filling in just based on intelligence built into, into the system. Uh, what that allows us to do, though, um, that's showing, uh, you know, you just clicked on a flange and put a flange in there, and that's showing your, or I'm sorry, you clicked on a butterfly, um, and it's putting that valve in there. The flanges come with, because how else are you going to connect a lug butterfly to a carbon steel pipe, right? It knows that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> so what I, what I wanted to point out here was when you do do this click around for estimated purposes, you get a couple of interesting things. Uh, one is um, a bill of materials, right? So, and that is so fundamental to having a good estimate is to say, look, this is my takeoff. This is, the, this is what the job looks like to me. And it's a 3D representation of that 2D um, of that 2D drawing. It's kind of hard to argue when you can say, here, look, this is the model, this is what it looks like. Um, and when I say model, trust me, I understand we're talking about an estimating model at this point, right? It's gonna have shit running through it, it's gonna have all kinds of collisions, that's not what we're worried about right now. What I'm worried about right now is having the half hour of labor that that represents on every single time I, take, I have a takeoff coming off of a main, right? Um, but the other thing you could start to do is, is flip systems between each other. So in this particular case, I can, I can quite literally just highlight a system and say, well, you know, instead of being, you know, uh, instead of being all flanged with lug butterflies and um, sweat copper, I just want to see what would happen if you were sweat copper but all that carbon went to a mechanically connected, um, in this particular case, of uh, uh, a Victaulic system. Um, so instead of a, instead of a fairly cheap um, lug style butterfly, I would now get a Vic 300 um, uh, butterfly valve, but then I wouldn't have welding for the flanges. I would have you know, fairly quick mechanical connections. Um, so what does that mean? And, and you can see these are, th these are real numbers now. See, so I would really, I would, I would look at, um, you know, $250,000, in this particular case, this was an actual flip I did to 347, but I, I have a really dramatic change in my mandates. You can really start to look at that when you have these integrated estimating systems. You can start to really flip these things around and look at them from different angles. That's what a sheet metal takeoff looks like when we open it up. Um, that's what a sheet metal takeoff looks like when we open it up. And what, what I mean by that is that these two things are the same thing. That's taken off with our duct systems on, on design line, on screen design line takeoff. That's the data that that represents. So I can say, hey, I want to see it in that form or I want to see it in this form. And this form is interesting because, you know, when you really take the time to embed all of your costs and all of your different um, factors and numbers and metrics into, the, into this estimating database, you get some fantastically precise information out of it. Um, and the, then you go to meetings and you know, the, the owner or the, or the owner's rep or the CM um, or the GC wants to know where you're coming up with some of these numbers and you go, look, this is, this is $11,000, this is $8,000, this is what it looks like. We can, we can do the loops differently if you want, but right now, this is what this job is, uh, both visually and in terms of data, so powerful. Um, so I know this looks like, holy hell, what is that? But, and it is, it's horrible, but this is what the, you know, this is what it looks like. These are the screens you have to go through to get that information in so you can run those types of analysis and understand what you're trying to accomplish. But, and it does take time, like a lot of time, but again, I think the value there is pretty self-evident. Um, so it's kind of estimating. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on BIM. I've got like 190 slides here, guys. So we're not. <laughs> so we're not going to spend a lot of time on all of them. Um, but uh, some of it gave me an hour, so I, I wanted to make sure I could talk for an hour. 
um, I can do that. I, here, I'll point, I'll point out a couple of things here. This was really interesting. This was that job in central, uh, that in central Illinois. So this is the one where our contract's 27 million. We've got uh, 12, 17 million to the, local, to the local sub, right? So this is the smarts and parts or technology travels or, you know, I'll design the thing, I'll BIM the thing, I'll build the thing, I'll ship it to you and then you can build it. Um, but this is high pressure flanged oval duct work and it was coming from a company in a totally different area of the United States. And what we did is we built their catalog in our system, right? And so, you know, I'm literally on the phone with their, their plant managers, you know, talking about how many inches of extension is there between the end of where this thing ends and where their actual factory installed flange is. But you, you put the time to build that. You get the value of having a coordinated system um, in a very complicated, uh, uh, um, seismic, uh, low, um, uh, seismic zone. So you've got all the, you know, 30, I think there was 30,000 longitudinal and latitudinal, you know, seismic bracings here. So you really don't want to be like, oh, yeah, I screwed that up. Sorry. Can, you know, you really don't want to have like surprises on, especially when you're, when your sub, when the mechanical, when the installing mechanical is your sub and you're at risk to him for change orders, right? You really don't want to screw around in that situation. So we put their, we put their systems into our BIM, we coordinated it, and then we actually sent the bill of materials directly out of the model to their fab shop, and then that material was uh, sent up to the, to the site. Um, in this particular case, we've got these, this is a data center where uh, there were these large, uh, large um, concrete uh, beams, and we were building these like special U clamps uh, to hang the big 24-inch uh, uh, chilled water lines. Um, so you know, just a couple of images to get you a sense of what what that looks like. And again, here's that hospital we were talking about, where we're the where we're not the local. Um, but I mean, if you just look at that, at the, at the detail of all the kickers and how, where the, that goes and where this goes, and again, 30,000 seismic bracings just in this uh, particular hospital alone. Um, again, that's got to be coordinated and it's got to be done right if you're really going to uh, put yourself at risk and prefabricate everything from hundreds of, hundreds of miles away. Um, so this is a robotic layout. I, I don't have a lot of good words for this. We use a lot of Trimble. Um, we use Trimble devices, robots for this. I know there's a lot of other uh, good quality tech out there. Um, but that process to us, you know, again, this is, so you, you do all the coordination to get all these hangers in, in, the, in the right locations, right? And then you send the MAJ of those hangers to our shop. So our shop guys have, um, have SMAP or CAM duct or whatever you want to call it, but something that'll open an MAJ. They've got that at their station in their shop. They open up these files, they see the, they can see the clevises and the, and the, and the trapeze, unistruts, angle iron, uh, needle beam, whatever, um, rollers, you know. Uh, they can see all those hangers and then they fab them. Uh-oh, okay, I got a little delay here. But they fab the hangers, and I'll show you uh, kind of what that looks like, but they print labels that have numbers, they have uh, fab reports, so they aggregate how many, you know, how many three-quarter inch, how many half inch uh, uh, footages of rod, quantities of clevis hangers, whatever it might be. Um, we either put them on pallets and shrink wrap them, or we put them on these hanger carts um, depending upon the job, these hanger carts have, have, uh, have been nice for us uh, over the last few years. You know, so that's what, we, we fabricate every hanger that we model in our shop. Uh, and so that's what the stickers look like. So you know, it's a, you know what system, it's got a color code, it's got a tag, right? Um, so those are all cut to length and ready to go. I think I don't need to go into a whole bunch of detail on how, on how Tremble or robotic layout works, but I mean, you've got, you've got your screen there, you got your robot telling you where to go, um, the architecture's embedded into the, into the system, right? So you're on site, you have a, a pad that looks like that, right? And it's telling you, hey, that P39, you wanna, find, you wanna put P39 in here, go 17 feet this way and two feet to the left, and you go where the thing tells you to go, and you drop your insert, right? 
And that's what that looks like. Um, a lot of people ask about the corrugated decking because obviously the goal is to have inserts, not to be going up and, and drilling up, right? The goal is to have inserts. Um, we use a flat piece of metal. We just burn out a few thousand of these at a time on, on our plasmas. Um, and, uh, and so if, the, if it's telling us to be um, on, the, on the angle of the corrugation, um, or at the or or at the bottom, we'll we'll, we'll just throw one of these and run a tech screw in real quick, and then drop it so that um, the top elevation or the the elevation of the top of the rod is always at the same location, right? In the model, it's not sometimes down here and sometimes down here. So in our model, we're always running it up to that to that elevation. Um, and then what does that mean? Well, that's what the job looks like when you've got you know when your crew has gone around and they've tagged all these inserts, right? Um, so now here, all these inserts are in, and they're all tagged, and then the guys come in and they put the hangers up, right? So I know we all do this, but um, you know it's important to just state that, look, how, think about this. You, have, you now have all of your fab done, all of your hangers done, all of the inserts done, everything waiting to go up, and nobody on this construction site on our side has, has pulled a tape measure out. That's amazing, right? That's amazing. Um, I, I will tell you, I, I was talking to a couple of people we were out, we were out with last night, and and you know, I it's, it's amazing. But now you know, I mean, that that foreman that I delivered a piece of crap drawing to in 1997, um, it, you know, now I go to the job site and they're like, where's the trim? Where are the hangers? What's going on? You know, um, they're waiting for this. This is how they're executing work now. Um, so that was the robotic layout. Again, to keep moving along, um, I got a couple of pictures of our, uh, this is the 104,000 square foot space that we talked about. This is where we're doing our hangers. We've got, I think, 15 bays of pipe positioners. Um, we've got multi-trade space. We've got, uh, just show you some images. You've got, pl so the plumbing, or the hydro hydro hydraulic, I'm just gonna say plumbing. You guys know what plumbing is, right? <laughs> plumbing. We have plumbing, plumbing prefabrication shop. Uh, that's that's the pipe. Um, that's more of the pipe. Uh, that's the plumbing back in here. So we do a ton of copper fabrication. Uh, I'll show you what some of that looks like. Um, I've got decoilers on my main coil line, two plasma tables, um, and then the water jet that's cutting the liner. Um, this is kind of a cool process. I, I think some people in the room might be interested in this, but. When you have a model, a piping model defined um, and done and coordinated, we go in there and we tell it where the field con connections are, right? So we have a, a, you know, as you're building along your model, it's assuming it's all shop welds. And then we go back once we've had a collaboration with our foreman and, uh, you know, we understand crane time and, and skips and space and we, you know, we build into, we go back into the model and we tell it, here's where all of your field connections are, right? Um, once you do that though, you can then push out this PCF file. So in, in CAD map, it's a PCF export is the command. And it pushes out this PCF file, which is really just a pretty fancy text file, to be perfectly honest with you. But there are a number of softwares out there. Um, we happen to use one called SpoolGen, but I know Autodesk makes one that will take PCF files and convert that to that. And I know to a lot of us this looks horrible, but trust me, if pipe fitters love this, um, or at least American pipe fitters really like this. These single line isometrics, they're more diagrammatic, they're symbols, there's the cuts, there's the uh, bill of materials. Now we've always produced drawings like this as mechanicals. This is, I, I, I remember the first day on the job, I, I, was, I was sketching one of these things up. Um, but it was always fairly painful, meaning, you know, once you had this model, you would, you would have a guy who was maybe making, I don't know, 18 spool drawings a day, 25, 30 spool drawings a day. Now, once the model has been, once you identify in the model where those field connects are, um, you tell this piece of software to go, hey, you know, you export your PCF and then you tell this piece of software to say, hey, go make all my spools. And it just runs overnight or over lunch and it, makes, it just makes thousands of them in, in an hour. Um, so pretty cool. And the other, the other really nice thing this software does is once it makes the spools, it also can talk to your five axis cutter. 
Um, so this, this machine is making the, the, the fish mouths. It's doing the straight cut, the bevel cut. If it's a manifold, I've got holes on it for like oldlets, threadolets, weldolets. This machine is burning out those. Um, it does lateral cuts for containment pipe, which is really, really interesting. But again, all that CNC, uh, all its CNC information is coming right out of the, out of the PCF file. So it's a kind of an added benefit Couple of other just shop, just shops, just so you guys get a sense of what it looks like. You know, rigging is almost its own trade. Uh, when you when you do some of the when you make some of these animal fittings, and it's like, oh my God, how how now we get a, you know how are we going to get this on a truck? You know, um, you, you make stuff like that, PRV stations um, with its own support. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you got to do stuff like that sometimes, right? You know, you make the, but rigging, you know, when you get really involved in prefabrication, you, you realize sometimes your best friends are, 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 are your fitters that really know how to rig the hell out of a, out of whatever, you know, out of whatever you happen to be making that day. You know, again, I'm not going to dwell on these, um, but, you know, pump packages, get the pumps in, get them, get them as well uh, spun up as you can. Um, there's a bunch of, uh, uh, there's a bunch of pumps that are going on, you know, valve assemblies, uh, big PRV steam stations, one third, two thirds. Um, you know, again, this is just, I just, here's what I did. I just said, well, I would love if, if all of these, if all, all my friends in Australia could come just see our operation. So what I did is I just went out and I took pictures and I tried to bring the, the damn thing to you guys. But uh, uh, steel fabrication, we do a fair bit of. Now, we're not steel fabricators, but you know, cooling tower steel, things we're responsible for. We will do um, the fabrication and the on-site installation of, the, of, that, of those uh, structural steel components. I'm going backwards, sorry. Um, there's some more. There's some more steel, big rollers right there. Um, and again, I've got copper. These are all in-wall plumbing. So this is the all. This is all the crap behind the wall when you when you get into your shower in your hotel room. Um, we make. We try to build that whole wall in our in our shop. Um, you know, and again, using the system to tag pipe, to make labels, to make manufacturing data. Um, these are magnetic tables. So these are little stands, um, and so you've got a shop drawing right here, and, you've, and you, you know what you're trying to build, and you're using the, the magnet, the little magnet things to kind of like um, move, your, move your support uh, system. You know, more plumbing, but again, but we're trying to do more and more and more copper. We're trying to become a 100% copper fab shop. Um, so that's more of that. Uh, those are carriers, so these are the things that you bolt the toilet onto. Again, this is what the you know, when you go into the bathroom in a hotel um, and there's a bunch of sinks and, and, and labs, this is what that wall looks like behind it. Um, and so often um, it's built on piece, you know, piece by piece stick building on hand. We're trying to build that whole wall again, more, more copper right there. Um, sheet metal, just, you know, that's what our, we bought a new coil line. That's what that looks like uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, we're trying not to put a piece of duct out the door without another piece of duct bolted to it, um, which is, believe it or not, for us, it's a change. You know, we really did used to send out that piece and that piece and that piece, and we're trying not to do that. We're trying to send out, so if it's a VAV, uh, we're trying to put a piece of duct on it, and we're trying to pipe it. Um, you know, if, if, it's just, if it's just sheet metal, we're trying to put a few pieces together and maybe a tap. Uh, that's uh, piping the sheet metal, I'm sorry, piping the VAVs in the shop. You know, again, we try to do that to every one of them. And that was kind of prefab. On the modular construction side, um, uh, we, we, we've done a, ser a series of things, and I know, I know there's a lot of people in this room, this, is, they're not, this whole concept isn't foreign to them. Um, so just go through a couple of examples where we've had success. These are head walls, we had 166 of these at a hospital, so that's what they look like finished. Um, but all of them were, uh, the, they were punched out on a sheet metal table and then the trades came in to a space uh, just off site of where we were actually building the hospital to go, uh, to go in and run their systems, electrical, uh, medical gas, obviously. Um, this is a, a movie that, uh, uh, it, it's a, it's a, Little bit complicated, but this this job was a. Can we play this? Okay. Um, so 
This was a this was a 36 uh, 3,600 ton cooling plant, and the deal was um, we 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 would we didn't have access to the slab on grade or um, uh, permit. We weren't going to have permits, and anywhere near the amount of time that this particular owner uh, needed this particular facility. And this is mission critical. So again, this is one of those where you kind of can't screw around. Um, so they were getting bids for modular plants from some company in Texas. And I know you guys might not be terribly familiar with Texas, but I don't want them doing my work. <laughs> um, so, so, they're getting, so they're getting bids for this, right? So what we did is we said, no, 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 no. So we built up a mock-up, a digital mock-up, inclusive of the architectural skin, which we also did uh, via our sheet metal trades. Um, we built together this, this digital mock-up, and then we took our modular construction space. Can you go back to that? Or mm. might not go through. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. But uh, can you f can you f go to the end of the movie and just see if that's where it ends? Yeah, yeah. Can you pull it back to like here? Maybe here. Hey guys, I need this movie to go like right here. Okay, okay. And then let's hopefully it'll just go. So um, no, but I, I, I want I want you to see this. We brought this thing in and we did uh, and we built the whole thing in our modular construction facility. So you're going to see bathroom pods happening. You're going to see a couple of other examples of modular construction. This is our main modular construction space. So I'm just being honest with you guys that look, we don't have like nine different modular construction buildings. We just got this one space that we've leveraged in a few different situations. Um, but this is the whole thing being built. So we've got electrical coming in, all the conduit, the, um, the structural. Uh, we filled it with water. We pressure tested. We, we, we uh, had the electricians run the wires and then cut it. And then, uh, and then we broke it down into 20 sections and delivered it on site. So it was our way of doing, um, uh, of, of being able to execute um, a modular construction chiller plant. There's that slab on grade that I talked about that wasn't available. Um, and, and again, that, this is what these sections looked like. That's a section right there. Again, there's 20 of those, not inclusive of the cooling towers of the steel. But again, there's a section coming in. And uh, you know, look, I, yeah, I'm proud of the fact that we were able to accomplish this, that we were to execute this job in such a way as to provide um, the owner with the ability to, to start uh, to start running their operation when they wanted to. Um, but look, th no, this is all, no BS here. There was another company that was going to come in and sell them this, this damn thing. Um, and they were, you know, so can we flip back to the pr presentation? Thanks. So a couple more pictures, but yeah, that, you know, yeah, great for Hill. Yeah, good job. But you know what? Look, how scary is that to think about? Look, that's a, that's a millions of dollars of, of, of a job that would have just walked on out to somebody else that was willing to do it modularly and had the capability of, of, of executing like that. So a couple of other pictures. And then can we flip back to the other one? So these, this, is, uh, this is off to the side of that space where we were just looking at that modular construction uh, space that's got a high bay uh, 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 crane. So these are bathroom pods um, that we're doing. Uh, we, we have these like flat um, platforms, perfectly level platforms, um, because it turns out that that's really important when you're, when you're building uh, modular bathrooms. Um, in this particular example, uh, so you can see we use the platforms to get some of the, excuse me, to get some of the, uh, um, the framing done, the flooring, the framing. Um, and then that moves off into a, into a different production section where you've, got, um, where you've got the floor coating and then all of the, that's the, where you've got a you know, station, 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 station for these things. And there's uh, 24 of them going on at a time at peak production right here. And uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I will talk very briefly about, um, uh, you know, about, the, the, you know, this is, so this is inclusive of the electrical, the tile. We were talking earlier about some of the things that are involved here. You're, um, 
can you flip back to the, uh, there you go. So that's what the drawing looks like. But I guess what I, what I would emphasize here is that, you know, um, there are other modular construction or bathroom pod builders in America, but you got to be real careful about what, you know, what these, some of these other companies are offering in terms of are they really running electrical? Do they really have tile? Do they really have china? Um, this thing has everything except the fire protection head and the nurse calls not connected for, uh, you know, code for healthcare code regulations in, in Chicago, which is probably a good thing anyway. But uh, there it is flying up um, in this, uh, in the, uh, we call that the pooper scooper. Uh, and there it's coming in and then it comes off and it gets jacked up and it goes on site. So we've got three jobs like this and I think this, I think you guys would find this interesting. One of them were the mechanical, plumbing, uh, fire protection and, um, and, and sheet metal contractor on the job. So we got all four trades, right? And so to, to bring this labor into our shop and to do it and execute it there was a certain type of a deal. The next one, we weren't the mechanical at all. Everything went to competitors. So it was us with absolutely no work, except we were able to convince the, uh, the team that they needed modular bathrooms and they wanted something to hang their hat on. So we got that work out of a job that we had totally lost. Um, and then the third one, again, I said there was three. The third one, uh, we're, we lost, again, we lost all the trades, uh, but um, we are being hired to make the bathrooms and then to, to set them because we have some expertise in understanding how to set these things based on, um, based on our first project. So that's what we're doing with that. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on some of this stuff, um, but uh, I do want to show, I want to show one thing. And that is, we saw what we were doing with MAJs, uh, with, with, MHAs with, with hangers in them, right? Right now, everything in our shop is an MAJ. So even if, I, even if the, the, the guy comes in and he wants some random angle iron, well, I've got a random angle iron in my system. Um, primarily, it was put there originally years ago for billing purposes. So from EST or CAM, CAM uh, duct, I can, you know, I have a process and I can, so if I put that random angle iron in there along with the rest of the duct fittings that are being ordered via that MAJ, I can then run a process and it creates this and then this thing talks to my business system. So now my financial system, my ERP knows that I got to charge, that I got to charge $207 to this cost code, to this cost type against that job number, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward. But it turns out, um, for, this is uh, for logistics purposes or for, for, for another reason I'll show you here in a minute. It's really cool to have everything in your shops digitized, right? At, this is a custom piece of software that we wrote um, that, that handles MAJ information. It, it talks to the MAJs and it talks to our, our, our business system. What's in our business system? Ours. Right? That's what's in our business system. That's what we make payroll with. So that business system understands all of the different hours against cost codes for all of our shop labor, field labor, uh, office labor. So everything you're looking at here, every one of these line items is an MAJ. And the MAJ knows a couple of things, right? Um, especially, you know, it's got to have some email or paperwork coming in so it knows when the guy wants it, right? So right there, what do you know? I know I've got an MAJ. Now the MAJ obviously knows all the pounds and MCA and you know fat hours and factors and all that, right? But but it also knows when it got it and, and when there when that material is needed, right? So if you think about it, how hard is it to say, well, hey, you know, you're you're in some custom application here, but how hard is it to say, hey, do you have plasma? Are you a plasma cut job, right? If you're a plasma cut job, are you, are you, have we started you in, in this set of time frame, right? Uh, and so you, you start to build these processes um, with, with this custom application. When you have the MAJs, and again, everything that you're making is in the MAJ, and you have the access to your business system, so you know what your, what your hours are like, you can do some really, really amazing things. Uh, so 
you know, here you're looking at you're looking at the durations based on SMACNA at 1.0, right? And I know you got to factor that, but you know, this job it's saying, hey, I got this job here. SMACNA says this job is a fabrication time of that many days. That's an interesting piece of information to have, especially when you aggregate that with all your other jobs. Um, you know, this is kind of scary here, but this is saying, like, look, I know who the foremen are, right? So this is saying, hey, what is my average lead time that I'm getting, right? Because again, I know what, when they want it and I know when I get it, right? I get it today and it's got a date on it. Just with those two things, I'm able to say, hey, here's how much my average lead time is. Um, here's my average size in pounds of, of the orders of, this is in sheet metal. We have it for plumbing and piping too, because again, everything's in an MHA, but. Um, and then here's, here's, my, here's my costs. So you think about this as a, as, a, uh, you know, as a business leader, you're looking at this and you're saying, wait a minute. This is, all, all these, these jobs right there are, are, are between two and three hundred dollars. All of this, all of these jobs right here are under a hundred dollars worth of, worth of, uh, worth of, of shop material. Just think about that. What does that mean? if a significant majority of your foremen are ordering something for under 100 bucks, it means they're probably not pre-planning very well. Or they're in an incredibly, credibly, credibly um, uh, regressive environment, right? Where they're, where they're just having to adapt uh, you know, to, to, to owner or GC or CM demands on a daily basis. But having this information, understanding is, uh, is gonna allow us to e execute our business differently in the future. Um, and then what's the first thing, at least the first thing I think of when I, when I started developing um, some, of these, some of these processes was metrics, right? We all want metrics, right? Um, I, I can tell in a, in, in a given moment what my production metrics are for, um, for my piping, plumbing, and sheet metal shop because again, it knows the time and it knows the, um, the pounds from the MAJ or if it was say carbon pipe, it knows how many MCA hours that represents at 1.0 and then obviously we have a factor, right? We're a factor of that. But I can say, hey, I'm making, I don't think I have a better one um, I'm, ma I'm, making, I'm making this particular, I'm making carbon steel six, six inch and down, I'm the six inches like this. Um, I'm making that at like, you know, 0.33 of MCA. And that's important for me to know, right? Um, and so again, this is, our, for, this is our first rudimentary attempt to be able to say, hey, I, to be able to understand um, these, are the, these are the MAJs right here. And then it goes and finds the hours against uh, against that right there. So there's your, your, there's your welded six, 0.24 of MCA against a total, uh, uh, and against a total aggregate air, uh, uh, of 477 hours. So some interesting stuff you can do if you really start to think about melding the, the, the BIM systems with the financial systems. And it's, it's, been, it's been amazing. So. That's really what I had for technology and process. I wanted to talk briefly about collaboration. And I don't think I can get through, I don't think I can get through all of it, but, but I'm gonna, I am gonna try. Um, so this is, this is the thing, right? We wanna build this and we wanna be a big happy team, right? We wanna be collaborative and we wanna, we wanna uh, protect each other as businesses and, and, and get and, and, and just you know build wonderful wonderful buildings for for our owners and our market right um, but you know you want bids right so let's talk about that for just a second this is a mechanical job right here it's really it's broken down into here's what it is it's materials it's field labor shop labor equipment subcontracts and then what I call the cost of work is just kind of like you know our time um, this is a mechanical job. Let's just look at what this means, right? Shop labor is 10%. Um, and I just showed you how we're running real time analytics and metrics on that, right? So if we really look at it, if we're trying to build something collaboratively and we really wanted to kind of go through each other's books and understand how do we have a relationship without a hard bid, right? 
There's different ways we can protect owners. There's different ways we can protect construction teams and be transparent and maintain our competitive advantage for, for most of what I would call the pie that represents that contract, right? Um, so I would start with shop labor. I mean, my shop labor is what it is, and I'll guarantee it at 0.25 of MCA or at 55 pounds per hour on sheet metal. Um, not only will I guarantee that, we can also look at it, and you can hold me accountable for that. Um, equipment is 15 to 25 or 20% of the of the job, and again, these are just numbers I wrote on the airplane, but you know, they're, they're relatively around the right number, right? But equipment, some percentage of the job, and that's gonna go out for a transparent bid anyway. And quite frankly, if you got one air handler at a million bucks and one air, hair, and air handler at 1.5 and one air handler at 1.25, you don't necessarily wanna buy the one, the one million dollar one, right? You wanna make a decision as a team that says, hey, I might want to spend that extra 200K because of what I get, right? You want to make that decision as a team anyway. Um, subcontracts, again, same thing, open bid. The pro professional services and what we you know, pay our professionals, um, that it kind of is what it is. Uh, materials, again, you're, you're doing BIM, so you're pushing that out to a BOM. So you can bid that out so the whole damn team can see, here's this guy, here's this guy, here's this guy. Um, you know, and, and again, there's what a pricing sheet looks like coming out of CAD, CAD map. Um, so that leaves field labor. Um, so again, what I'm, I guess what I'm just said is of that pie, that mechanical contract pie, whatever that value is, 75% of that can still be, you can still protect your owners even though you're not in a bid-build relationship by using some of the technology and the process we talked about earlier. Um, field labor, I don't have a ton of great things to say about that. That is a hard thing to control. Um, ask me about that when you invite me to BIM Met Boffs next year, and we'll go through it. And, but I will say that you know, there, 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 is, there are things that we are doing when you look at the trimbles and the hanger and that process, and you look at that, you go, I, this has got to be better than 40 guys running around a job with welding torches, right? We've got to be doing a better job. Um, so that's one point I wanted to make. Let's say we do get into a collaborative environment. Let's say we are in one of these, um, in one of these situations where we're a collaborative team. Um, well, what, this, is what, this is kind of the dynamic that we look at right now. And I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this because we talked about this yesterday. Um, Bill, you had some really good questions about this process. The Autodesk guys are gonna talk about this. But I am gonna just kind of like, you know, just, just kind of show you, we, I, this is a problem for us too, where you've got once, where let's say you've got your design community here and you've got your construction guys here and everybody's on the same page, everybody's on the table, everybody's involved, it's an IPD job or IPD light or IPD hybrid, design builder, design assist, or some damn word where the thing didn't go to the street for bid. There's a team and we're meant to collaborate and we have every intention of collaborating while protecting our building, our, our business interests, right? This is a problem because some guy just wants to use all Revit and we don't have BIM Met Boss, so we're, we're at enormous disadvantage when it comes to that. Um, or you've got the construction team that wants to use, and these, this is by no means comprehensive. This is just, it just it fit on the page. Um, th there are a lot of companies that, you know, that are a lot of softwares and technologies that the construction team is gonna use to execute their, their you know, so this is fire protection stuff, that's mechanicals who don't know what they're doing use that stuff. <laughs> but what does that really mean? What does that really mean? So look, I, th this is what I see in America, and maybe this is a place for you guys as Australians to say, boy, we don't, we don't do that, right? But this is what we see in America. We see Revit models that are just completely unworkable. Um, they're, they're not done with anything near a, a, a BIM Met Boss uh, initiative. They're done with generic families. You can't build it. You can't make the, the, the elevations. Uh, you, you couldn't put in that many fittings if you wanted to because you would drive yourself out of business. Um, you, you know, I, there, I, I think I counted 11 fittings between there and there when you, you, can't, you can't make that, right? Um, so this is just, again, engineers and consultants trying under their contract value, under their fee structure, to produce something real. 
And um, I love that. That is my favorite. <laughs> this is, so no shit, this is a consulting engineer gave this to me as a work product and said, here, I'm part of the team. Um, can you imagine what they would do if I put that in a model and they were out walking the job? Um, although how you'd cut that on the longitudinal, I don't know. But this is what we're dealing with on a daily basis. And, uh, and so I think I'm gonna kind of leave it here because what we're, what we're starting to play with now is the 2016 stuff where you can, uh, where you can do the fab, the fab job into and out of Revit, right? So I hope we, we see this a little bit later. But you know, there, there you're, there's my, that's my fabrication database, and here it is inside Revit. And I was very excited to see that because, again, um, you know, to, just to be, you know, hard, you know, to be explicit, we're, you know, so in, invested in the MAJ format right now. Um, I, it, right now, it looks like the, the direction we're going is being able to kind of like talk uh, and communicate in that in that environment. Um, we'll see where that goes, but. Um, there's a, here's an EP model in Revit is an RVT link. Um, and then one final thing, I have, I have 30 seconds. One final thing is here, is a, here is, a, is a Revit model that was brought back from Revit into SDMEP uh, and I'm doing real-time cost analysis. So now I kind of completed the circle a little bit here and now here we are, we, we're, we're, we're actually saying, hey, what are the impacts, the financial, the cost impacts of those changes um, in, in, in you know, using that software that we started way, way back in the beginning to, to estimate with. So um, that is, that's our operation in a nutshell. So thank you very much. Yeah. Just Richard, yeah. Dave, Richard Drigo from Freedon. Mate, how are you how are you assessing the modular offsite fabrication and how do you see that going in the future with relate in relation to imports? We're seeing a lot of that going on now. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think you'll change your business model? Do you think you'll focus more or where do you think as a business you're going to go with it? Yeah, like I said, there are there's multiple uh, there are multiple people, uh, you know, small companies, and and they're typically in like lower wage uh, area, you know, more rural areas of the country that are offering these bathroom pods, right? Um, there were there we had competition for that chiller plant, um, so. And I know, uh, I know we did talk earlier, I would let the audience know that, yeah, you're seeing, you're seeing Asian imports. You're seeing modular Asian imports in, into the Australian marketplace. I don't have a real good answer, but I know I'm marketing the hell out of, out of Hill as being a modular solution provider. Um, what that means exactly right, right now, I, I don't know. I will say, on the bathroom pot in particular, um, what we're producing is is cost comparable barely to the to the non-union um, bathroom pod manufacturer, the startup bathroom pod manufacturer, when you include all of when you equalize, right? Meaning that they might not have all the electrical in, they might not have the flooring might not be exactly what the owner wants. Um, so when you look at some of the quality issues, when you look at some of the comprehensive issues, uh, you know, I, I think that we, we can, in some instances, possibly hold our own where we're currently at. To, to be totally honest with you, what that also means is do we have to possibly start another operation at some point? Quite frankly, those, we're having that discussion. That good? Yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah. I'll repeat the question if you, oh, you got a mic. Hi, it's Brian Renehan here from GHD. Just interested in your um, estimating approach and, and you showed um, estimating from PDFs in that particular situation. Um, there's obviously a big discussion, I think, particularly in America in regard to handing models, design models over to contractors for estimating. Right. In regard to processes and in regard to 
keeping everyone happy and everyone's risks happy, things like that. Do you see that there might be a happy medium in, in that process happening where a model, a design model is handed across as part of the estimating tool? Um, if by happy medium you mean that the engineer will produce a narrative and then I'll do the production, um, that'd be great. You know, that's where we've had success, to be perfectly honest with you. You know, look, I, 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 I chide a little bit with, 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 our, with our consulting friends, but it, it, you know, and it's come up in multiple different venues, um, but let's just be honest with ourselves as an industry, right? We, you know, you look at a consulting engineer, they have a certain fee. In that fee, they have traditionally produced uncoordinated, diagrammatic, schematic, you know, 2D documents, right? We're not changing their fee structure, and we're sure as hell not making the schedule any better on them, right? And we're asking them to produce coordinated Revit. Come on, it, it, it's not realistic. Where we've had success is where we've been in these collaborative environments, we've been able to sit down with the owner, with the, with the architect, with the consulting engineer, and we use the, we, you know, look, we need those, we, especially for mechanicals, we need that consulting engineer. We need that, that, that horsepower. We need those smarts. We need that system narrative. We, we need to understand the zoning and, and, and what we're trying to accomplish, whether it's on the air side or the water side or electric this or whatever. We need those people to drive us to make the model that's gonna end up being the basis of our cost estimate. Does that make sense? Now, it, can that happen in a bid build? Not, not so much, which is why I showed those other tools and I'm not trying to pretend that we're, we don't engage in a bid build business, we do. And when we do, we try to use those wind whiz bane estimating tools as best we can. But if we're gonna be in that type of a collaborative environment, then I think it's best if we use our system to produce that initial model. Yeah? yeah? Yeah. That's where we've had financial, I'm just gonna be honest with you, that's where we've had real, real, real nice success. And, and where, the, where the consulting engineer then took our, our, our modestly coordinated first run at the model, right? We, we know it, it's not 100% coordinated, but it's got real parts and pieces and it's our effort to, to try to get, and they take that thing and they put their border on it and they stamp it and they send it in for permit. And that's where we've had success. Yeah. I'll just pick up on that. So in our world, we have a design to budget criteria in the contract. So we own the model. And if we say, give us the model, uh, we get it, we turn it over. And as I described when I talked, we use a CM in pre-construction services. And we're increasingly putting pressure on those CMs to come in with this kind of expertise to say, I'm gonna, I guarantee I'll give you whatever you model you want. I want you to validate whether the architect and engineer are designing to budget or not. So what we typically do is we share the model with the CM, hopefully he has the expertise that uh, he has to do this pricing, and we also require that the AE has their own internal estimator to uh, do a cost reconciliation. Mm -hmm. So in our world, the model and the work product, we own it, it's free game, and I'm listening to this thinking I need to put more pressure on getting this level of expertise to be able to spit out really good, uh, not only BIM model uh, evaluations for completeness, but also cost estimate. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you, guys. I really appreciated doing this.